Welcome into episode 131 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. And I'm August Trombiter. The good, the bad, and the bugly this week. The good, trying to protect children. Oh, that's good, isn't it? The bad, leaving disaster victims prone to scammers. <laughs> that's really bad. And the bugly, Apple plugs a bunch of security vulnerabilities. Saddle up, buckaroos, for another edition of The Checklist. Brought to you by Secure Mac. Think of the children. A bipartisan rallying cry since we stopped sending kids down the mines. Think of the children. <laughs> A pair of senators from the Senate. That's where the senators are. They're doing just that. They're thinking of the children, August, particularly <laughs> protecting their data privacy. Uh, Peace from the Verge says Senators Ed Markey, Democrat of Massachusetts, and Josh Hawley, Republican of Missouri, proposed a major update to the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. The piece says the proposed legislation would codify a set of parental controls and ban targeted advertising to young minors. The piece says the measure would amend COPPA in order to extend privacy protections to children up to age 15, COPPA already prohibits companies like Facebook and Google from collecting personal data and location information from anyone under the age of 13 without explicit parental consent. But the senator's new bill amending the law would extend protections to children up to the age of 15. However, if approved, platforms would only be able to collect the data of children aged 13 to 15 with their own personal consent and not that of their parents. The lawmakers are quoted as saying in 2019, children and adolescents, every move is monitored online, and even the youngest are bombarded with advertising when they go online to do their homework, talk to friends, and play games. In the 21st century, we need to pass bipartisan and bicameral COPPA 2.0 legislation that puts children's well-being at the top of Congress's priority list. If we can agree on anything... It should be that children deserve strong and effective protections online. Okay, yes. I mean, there's there's like part of me that thinks maybe we should be able to agree uh, to more than that. But here's what I found myself wondering as, as, as we begin this conversation. Uh, do lawmakers take tech seriously or really do they take it as seriously as they should? Um, I think both of those are great questions. I think the the first thing you have to ask yourself, is it COPPA or COPA? As in COPA <laughs> Cabana, because Barry Manilow would definitely be on board for this. See, okay, <laughs> here's what you don't know. I spent so long trying to decide how I was going to pronounce that. I finally decided it was probably COPPA, like, you know, sort of like copper, but, you know... <laughs> Coppa, right? <laughs> As opposed to Copa, because yes, then well, we're all going to have that song in our heads now anyway, <laughs> thanks to you. All right, I guess my other question, honestly, is do we take tech seriously? <laughs> and and really, uh, the question is, do you take tech seriously enough, August? You know... Now, okay, talk to me about the lawmakers, seriously, because on the one hand, I think, yay, they're trying to do something to protect children. On the other hand, I think, yay, they're trying to be seen as trying to do something to protect children. Yeah, I, you know, as much as I would love to think that it's the former, I think, especially these days, it's the latter. You know, the thing you have to remember about lawmakers is that they are great at making sure that they remain lawmakers. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. I mean, everybody's got a job to do. But would you trust the guy who's making your dinner to also make health department regulations about that dinner? Um, (laughs) Well, I mean, well, here's the thing. They're not actually going to get their hands dirty with this, but we'll get to that part in a moment. I mean... (sighs) it's easy to use uh, politicians as a punching bag. I kind of have to wonder, though, if the general public takes tech as seriously as it should, too. I I think it's really easy for all of us, uh, you, me, and everyone else, to sort of hand off responsibility to other people. Um, At the end of the day, this really is our problem, and it's not the lawmaker's problem. And what we need to do as citizens is to make sure it's their problem. 
And that's to reach out to them and say, look, these are the things that we're concerned about. These are the things we want done. And hopefully, you know, things will happen. Is this a good first step? Sure. Absolutely. Um, but honestly, extending the lifetime of COPPA from 50, you know, to up to 15 to 15 to 17, is it really that, you know, is it that big of a deal? I don't think that it is. And we've got bigger fish to fry. We've got more important things when it comes to data privacy, especially with our kids to worry about. And those are the things that we should be targeting. See, uh, there are a number of things that I sort of wonder about in here. And, and you've hit on a few topics that I thought we would get to later, but we can go ahead and get to it now. I mean, <sighs> them having this conversation does raise awareness. And I do like that part, right? I sure. mean, if, if, if Marky and Holly end up doing something that gets people actually reading about it or thinking about it, right? And then, you know, parents start reading about it and they're like, oh, well, this is actually really important. And then they decide that maybe this legislation doesn't go far enough. Okay, great. We've raised awareness. At the same time, I do worry about the thing that you're talking about where somebody goes, oh, thank goodness, somebody did something about it. I don't have to anymore or I don't have to worry about it anymore. You know, somebody's got us covered. Now, I will say there is a provision in this proposal that sounds commendable. Uh, if approved, the piece says it would create what the senators called an erase button that would remove all of a child's data from the related service. If a parent or child decides to delete all of their data, no platform would be able to discontinue service to that user. Well, it sounds good to me. How does that sound to you? I, I love the idea. I think it's a great idea. Uh, but it's an easy button. And yeah. there's no easy button for data privacy. And that's sort of what they're talking about. I mean, imagine if you could go to, say, Facebook and there was an easy button to delete all of your data. Mm -hmm. um, that would be awesome. But we've been asking for that for 10 years. <laughs> right. You know, well, no, here's the thing, though. <laughs> Facebook actually does have that. But the only way to do that, I mean, first of all, you have to trust that Facebook's doing it. And that's a whole other question for a whole other time. Exactly. But I mean, you the, the way to get all of your data off of Facebook also involves completely turning off your account and going away. I mean, what they're saying here is you you could go and say, I want you to take all the information about my 13 year old off of your of your servers, you know, take all of the information that you are storing on them away, but don't knock them out of it just because I want their information gone. Right. But okay, you know, um, imagine, imagine your twelve year old self, and your twelve year old self wrote and said and did stupid things. Mm -hmm. You know, this is saying, I want to get rid of all of those stupid things that my 12 year old self wrote and said and did. And there's nothing wrong with that because we all did dumb stuff when we were 12. And we all thought dumb stuff when we were 12. But servers aren't like a journal. You can't just throw a server into a fire and watch all of that stuff just go up in flames and you never have to worry about it again because that stuff comes back to haunt you. There's just no easy way to delete that data. There's just not. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to quote, uh, I'm going to quote John F. Kennedy. Oh we, my. We choose to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. No, here's the thing. I mean, look at what Europe has done with GDRP, right? I don't know how well it's going. I don't know if that information is actually really gone, but they have codified the right to be forgotten. They've codified the right to have the information about you removed. And we sit here and say, well, you can never do this. And what I say is you can never do this because so far nobody has demanded that we do it. Now, I, I mean, I, look, I have no faith that faith, Facebook would actually do it. I don't believe in and, all and the I think, people. I, honestly, that that's the crux of the problem. It's not the demanding that we do this. It's not the do it because it's hard thing. It's not mm -hmm. because Europe has codified a law. It's that 
the corporations here are so intractable in their desire to suck up every single piece of data about you that makes it really hard to throw that stuff away that they're not going to do it without some severe penalties. Well, okay, agreed. Yes, that's true. But right now, uh, we're supposed to be thinking about the children, August, so let's get back to that. <laughs> Lest you think this is an area that's been completely ignored. Uh, the Verge says, just last month, the Federal Trade Commission penalized TikTok's parent company with a record-setting $5.7 million for violating current COPPA regulations. In a press release, the Federal Trade Commission claimed that TikTok was collecting the personal data of children under 13 without receiving explicit consent from their parents. Under these proposed rules, apps and platforms like TikTok would have to abide by stronger privacy protections for children up to the age of 15 as well. Platforms would also be barred from serving targeted ads to children under 13. Now, here's a part that's both commendable and, I think, ludicrous. When it comes to connected devices and toys targeted toward children, the piece says, the bill would also ensure that companies and manufacturers include some kind of disclosure on the packaging for parents, detailing how their child's data would be collected, retained, shared, and protected. And if those devices don't meet a set of robust cybersecurity standards, uh, they would be banned from stores. Uh, from the people who brought you, by continuing to use this site, you agree, comes... By buying this product, you agreed to the terms and conditions printed in very small letters on the side of the box that you absolutely promise you read while standing in Target with your rug rat saying, please, 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 will you buy it for me, please? I guess the real question I have, August, uh, and it's one that I ask now and again, am I being too cynical? You're always too cynical. Yeah. Um, I'm more cynical than you are. <laughs> it's. I mean, here's the thing. Well, it's commendable to put that on the side, but... It's it's like it is like everything that we click through and say that we have you know read and agree to. I mean, it's just not that's that's almost a ludicrous proposal, except that it's I mean, that should actually be written as CYA amendment. You know what I mean? That's just covering somebody's backside because now lawmakers can turn around and say, well, it said right on the box in really tiny print. Uh, and it had to be really tiny because we did it in six different languages because we wanted to be sure that everybody <laughs> could read it. Right. Which is just not the case. It's going to be. Well, if it's going to happen, it's going to be tiny. Uh, the piece goes on, by the way, to say once approved, companies would have a year before they would be required to disclose to its users in plain language the types of data it collects, how it's used and the mechanisms used in order to ensure that the data is not collected from minors. Now, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like, would you want, you know, these guys to also run, you know, the other thing? I mean, it sounds like the senators are looking to the people who gather information on kids to come up with ways to not gather information on kids, which I guess is sort of good. You want a surgeon to perform surgery. You want a chef to prepare your food. I don't want lawmakers telling specialists how to do what they do. But I also don't know that you can trust a group that's made its bones targeting children to come up with ways to not target children. If that was their interest, they would have started by not targeting children. And then, of course, we do have to wonder as well about the hole that's left where the data used to go, right? I mean, it's yeah, that's sort of the shadow profile thing that we're talking about. Right. Uh, you know, and, and that's the real trick, isn't it? You know, can any lawmaker understand what happens in the business world? And can any entrepreneur not find a way to sidestep those lawmakers? You are cynical. To the bad we go. A story from the Washington Post says the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, shared personal addresses and banking information of more than 2 million U.S. disaster survivors in what the agency acknowledged last week was a major privacy incident. You think? Uh, the piece continues. The data mishap discovered recently and the subject of a report by the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General occurred when the agency shared sensitive, personally identifiable information of disaster survivors who used FEMA's Transitional Sheltering Assistance, or TSA, program, according to officials at FEMA. 
Those affected included the victims of California wildfires in 2017 and Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, the report said. In a statement, Lizzie Litzow, FEMA's press secretary, said FEMA provided more information than was necessary while transferring disaster survivor information to a contractor. We believe this oversharing has impacted approximately 2.5 million disaster survivors, said the Department of Homeland Security official, who asked for anonymity to provide background information beyond the official FEMA statement. He said 1.8 million people had both their banking information and addresses revealed, and about 725,000 people had just their addresses shared. Um, I assume there is absolutely no reason that I should feel good about this. <laughs> Actually, I, I think the transparency that FEMA is showing um, is a good thing for you to feel good about. Well, uh, first of all, we don't know. I mean, I mean, you know, events, but when you talk about transparency, we don't know who got this information. Absolutely. Though, though, True. Though, they've, True. though they've been asked and we don't know what happened to it. But, you know, we'll get back to that. I'll tell you why I get stuck on this whole thing. Uh, FEMA's TSA is meant to give shelter to people who need it after emergency shelters have closed. Uh, the program site said, you know, they may put people in a hotel, motel, holiday in. They may put people, you know, up someplace besides one of the uh, one of the shelters, uh, but they won't cover incidentals. And, you know, I assume resort fees are waived in the situation. <laughs> Here's the thing. It sounds like the information that was shared, you know, address and banking info is the kind of information that I'd have to share if I was staying in a hotel anyway. But of course, this isn't that. I mean, survivors of fires and floods aren't going on vacation. And if they're dealing with FEMA, they think they're dealing with FEMA, not that FEMA is giving their information to a hotelier, you know, be that something as big as Hilton or as small as the mom and pop joint down the way. Like, why does FEMA even have this information? I mean, I know why FEMA would have the address of the people, but why would they have the credit card information? Like, am I having to give my credit card to FEMA in the, in case of incidentals? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just don't understand that, th it. Th that actually is a very good question. I, and I don't know what the answer is because uh, I've never been in that situation. Right. But and, and nor do we work for FEMA. Now, uh, there's another thing that I got to ask you. And this goes back to a question that I asked a few weeks ago about how Facebook could accidentally be getting information that apps were you know, secretly sending. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security says FEMA overshared. And I'm still trying to figure out how that information is received if the receiver isn't expecting it or looking for it. And and maybe I'm just oversimplifying it. To my head, it's it's the square peg in the round hole thing. If I'm looking for names and that's it, and you send me name and credit card number, how is it that I end up holding on to the credit card number if all I was prepared to receive was a name? I think in a situation like this, uh, it's a little different in that a lot of times information is shared from person to person, agency to agency, where there is extraneous information. Whereas what we talked about a couple of weeks ago was one server talking to another server and that server just sucking in all of the data. Um, whereas this is sort of like me going, well, here's my contact information and you going, oh, well, look, you, your birth date's on here, you know, and did I mean to give you my birth date? No, but it was in my contact card. Um, well, and, and that would be, I would understand what you're saying if I were, you know, a robot and not human. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, or maybe it's the other way around. If I were a robot, cause here's the thing, like, 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 <sighs> Uh, transmission has to be coded. Reception has to be coded, right? I mean, it's not like I, I, I'm not sending a piece of paper through the Internet. I'm sending, you know, uh, th this information and this information. It seems to me if it gets to the other end and there's no there's no place to receive that second bit of information and that second bit of information would would cease to be. Sure. And if we were talking server to server, com, you know, uh, communication, I would totally agree. I don't know exactly what we're talking about here, but if it's if it's you know Barb at uh, you know FEMA sending 
bill at some other, you know, organization a spreadsheet. 2.5 million people, man. 2.5 million people. I, I mean, here, I here's the it. other thing. I totally get it. I, I totally get it. But if Bill gets that, and he goes, oh, look, here's all these credit card numbers. And Bill does nothing with those credit card numbers. In that particular case, everything is fine. See, here's the other thing that worries me. And you, you were sort of applauding them earlier for their transparency. But they're not nearly as transparent as I want them to be. Um, I assume that it's a hotelier that got all this information. But that's not a safe assumption. Uh, the, the report says, Litzow uh, said FEMA has taken aggressive measures to correct this error. Uh, FEMA is no longer sharing unnecessary data with the contractor and has conducted a detailed review of the contractor's information system. Uh, FEMA declined to identify the contractor. Why? I mean, and, and you know, I mean, I'm trying to think of a, who it could be besides a hotelier. And then if it's not a hotel chain, who is then, it? then what the heck? Right. Exactly. I mean, I, I kind of wish they would say, you know, well, it was a hotel company. Or, oh, it was, you know, I, I, well, I, I just want them to say who it is. Because now what I'm wondering is, like, like what are people supposed to be watching out for? Right. I, I'm a huge fan of transparency. And if somebody screws up, you just raise your hand and you said, hey, I screwed up. And here's how I screwed up. Uh, here's why I screwed up. And here's why I won't screw up again. The government and pretty much any organization these days, mostly because, you know, <laughs> of our legal system, um, any statement is just covering rather than truth and rather than transparency. And I, you know, based on what you just said about them, you know, not identifying the contractor, to me, that just, uh that drives me crazy. So, uh, any 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 good feels that I had at the beginning of this story are now bad feels. <laughs> well, then, then my job here is done. <laughs> Except, of course, it's not. Uh, there is good news, by the way. If you want a tiny bit of good feels here, uh, there's no indication that the oversharing has led to nefarious activity. Uh, of course, the bad news is it still could. Uh, according to the Post, the Inspector General report said that the privacy mishap threatened survivors with identity theft and fraud. That report, dated March 15th, estimated that 2.3 million people had been affected, slightly less than the estimate provided by the DHS official on Friday. And now, on the off chance that one of the 2.3 million people affected is listening, uh, what sorts of things should they be watching out for? Uh, I would be watching out for any suspicious activity on your credit card statements, uh, any suspicious activity uh, related to your credit at all. Um, really keep an eye on those things, your bank account statements, any of that, uh, just to make sure that no one is, is using those numbers to basically take advantage of you and your money. The other thing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, the other thing is, I mean, anybody who got this information may know how they came across it. They may know that it came from this FEMA thing. And if you're on whatever FEMA uh, program that you were on, if you were part of the TSA program, for example, you probably dealt with FEMA enough to have some idea of what dealing with FEMA is like. So if you suddenly get a different call from a different person that sounds completely different, but they swear they're from FEMA. I mean, this goes back to all the things that we've talked about before. You get a call out of the blue that you weren't expecting. It's a, it's a thing that you didn't know about before. I, I'm assuming just like when the Apple store doesn't call you, but says that it's the Apple store calling you. I mean, follow all those best practices as well, right? Double check, make sure, don't just start giving out information because somebody called and said, I'm with the government and I need this. Absolutely. Time to update everything. Woohoo! We'll tell you why and how in a moment, but first a word about MacScan 3 from Secure Mac. People used to think that Macs were immune to malware. While that's never been true, it's less true today than ever before. More and more people are using Macs, doing more shopping, storing more information, 
giving more bad guys more reasons to try to hack in. The number of malicious files for Macs has increased exponentially over the last decade. Staying ahead of the bad guys is important, and MacScan 3 can help. MacScan 3 is a great defense against malicious software attacks aimed at your Mac. It detects and removes Mac malware, catches keyloggers, removes tracking cookies, and provides full range or targeted scanning, all without crowding up your hard drive or slowing down your computer. Give worry the boot with MacScan 3 from Secure Mac. Sign up for a free 30-day trial today at securemac.com slash macscan. That's MacScan 3 by Secure Mac. Your 30-day free trial is waiting at securemac.com slash macscan. Updates from Apple this week, but what do they mean for your security? Honestly, one uh, freaked me out, and I, I didn't read all of the list of every single thing and every single thing that everything did, but Nicholas Tachek sent us uh, one that should freak us out. Uh, iOS 12.2 <laughs> fixed a lot of issues, including one that might let ne'er-do-wells access the microphone in an iOS device without the owner knowing. Uh, sort of like the FaceTime audio thing from earlier this year, but without the embarrassment on Apple's part of having a 14-year-old kid find it and then ignoring <laughs> that 14-year-old kid for over a week. Now, like I say, I don't want to go through the individual issues addressed, partly because that's boring, uh, partly because they're fixed, and partly because there are 41 of them for iOS. Uh, update your iOS devices is the point. Here to tell us how... <laughs> is Augustrometer. <laughs> if you want to update your iOS devices, it's easy. You plug in your device to a power. Uh, that's always important. Tap settings, general, and then software update. Um, tap download and install. And uh, everything else should pretty much follow from there. It's easy. Why is it important to uh, have it plugged into power? Uh, because you don't know how long that update's going to take. Oh, okay. And if your phone is kind of a little low on power, you just want to make sure that... Uh, <laughs> right. Okay. Now that, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I was just thinking I did not have mine plugged in the other day. Sure. But it was also at like 90%. Yeah. So, so that's cool. Now, I know you are the, one of the guys who uh, says that people should have um, automatically update. I do. On. And often I will wake up in the morning and go, oh, they updated overnight. Um, because that's generally when those things happen. Um, and I definitely recommend turning that on. You can do that also with your system settings. See, I'm, I'm not that guy, but we've talked about that before. I say whatever feels good to you, honestly, just don't leave it for too long. Like I don't, I don't have mine set to automatically update because I want to be able to read like three hours of stories because if the story is, it's available now and that's fine. And three hours later, the story is it's available now and that's fine. That's great. On the off chance that three hours later, the story is going to be bricking a number of phones across the country. <laughs> I want to wait a little bit, but I mean, I yeah, mean, I, I totally get that. But I know too many people who just leave their stuff unupdated uh, and they go way too long before they get to that update point. And I like to have it done ASAP. It's got all the security changes, and that makes me feel safer. Uh, Mac OS also got an update this week. Apple says the update patches 35 security holes. Uh, the point being, update your Mac. Here to tell you how <laughs> is Augustrometer. Hey, it's actually very similar to updating your phone. Um, if you go to the Apple menu uh, on pretty much any screen of your Mac uh, and choose system preferences. And then under system preferences, uh, you choose uh, software update and that will get you your software update. Click update now and it will take care of everything you need to take care of. Do you have an Apple TV? All the cool kids do. <laughs> Apple TV's running TVOS got an update to version 12.2 this week. Apple security site says the tvOS update plugged 27 security issues. Update your Apple TV. Here to tell you how to do it is Mr. Augustrometer. On Apple TV, you just go to settings, uh, system, and software updates. 
and then you select update software and you're good to go. It will take care of everything for you. Now, this is one that I do forget about a lot. This is the one device that I leave um, update automatically on. And I think it's I think it's because I was that guy for Apple TV, because when I go to Apple TV, it's not like in the old days when you just turn the TV on and leave it on. Right. When you go to Apple TV, you're going to watch a thing you're right. going specifically to sure. do it. It's, it's a different sort of thing. And so when I go to do that, I'm not thinking, oh, should I check for an update? So for this one, I personally have uh, update automatically turned on. Um, you know, and if it comes back to bite me one day, then, then yeah, that'll be on me. But I, I, I will say that, you know, Apple does a great job, even for those who are sort of laggards in terms of updating their their stuff. Um, they do a, a fairly great job of giving you notifications saying, especially on iOS, saying, hey, by the way, this is available. Update it now. Um, yeah. which is always really, really helpful and really, really a good thing to do. Yeah, you're making the case now against having automatic updates turned on, but we'll let that slide. Um, <laughs> if you're sporting Apple's chronometer, there is a flea circus worth of fixes waiting to get onto your wrist. Uh, Apple on Wednesday released Watch OS 5.2. Apple security site says it fixes 24 security issues. Update your Apple Watch. Here to tell us how. <laughs> Is Augustometer? It's really easy, actually. Uh, first of all, the Apple Watch, for whatever reason, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but you have to have it on the charger to do the updates. Um, mm -hmm. So put it on your charger, and then on your phone, you open the Apple Watch app, uh, then tap the My Watch tab, uh, tap General, and then Software Update, and then Update Software from there. Um, Remind me, you had an Apple Watch. You no longer wear your Apple Watch. Is that correct? Um, my Apple Watch uh, decided to take a dirt nap. And mm -hmm. uh, so I can't use the Apple Watch right now. Uh, but I'm looking forward to probably the next Apple Watch that comes out. Okay. See, because what you said about making sure that your phone's plugged in. That's got to be why Apple wants it on the uh, on the charger. Because, well, first of all, because it has to actually be close to the iPhone if memory serves. But the other thing is, man, they can take like a million years. the 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 update for Apple Watch takes forever. the 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 phone update is more of a good suggestion. The watch update is a requirement. You yes. have to have that powered and on a charger in order to do the updates. Yeah. So, you know, be sure, well, I was going to say be sure you know that before you start the update, but you can't start the update without it being on the <laughs> exactly. charger. So exactly. there you go. Uh, a few other releases tackled a few other security issues. Uh, they include 12 security issues patched in iCloud for Windows 7.11 and 11 security issues patched in iTunes 12.9.4 for Windows. Uh, those are for Windows. So seriously, get a Mac. I'm kidding. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do stay on top of your updates. Uh, August is a Mac and an iOS guy, so I'm not going to ask him to tell you how to update those, as I say. If you use iCloud or iTunes for Windows, stay on top of your updates. Finally, Apple did update Xcode 10.2 with one security patch, if that's a thing you use. My guess is you know what to do. Hey, if you're looking for more security news and how-tos, the place to look is securemac.com slash checklist. There you will find notes for this show, for the last show, for the show before that one, and you start to get the idea. SecureMac.com slash checklist. If you have a question you'd like to ask or a topic you'd like to hear us hit, our email address is checklist at SecureMac.com. The address again is checklist at SecureMac.com. And if you can't remember that, please do remember this. You're listening to The Checklist, brought to you by SecureMac. And we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>